So to begin, why is an economist talking about defense or foreign intervention in the first place? When we think about these topics, they often think about them within response or with respect to things like uh, international relations or political science. So why is an economist talking about these topics to begin with? Well, an economist or economics is the study of purposeful or purposive human action. So when people take on some kind of an action, large or small or anywhere in between, that is the subject of economic study. Whenever people are acting to try to achieve some sort of a goal, that is something where we can use economic analysis. So what I have here is what this looks like within the context of, say, war, peace, or other types of defense policies. There's some kind of preferred end state, so some goal that we often talk about states or governments is trying to achieve, and then we have individuals who are trying to impose plans to get us to a quote-unquote better outcome. Economics is helpful in analyzing these types of questions or these types of dynamics because, as I have up here on the slides, is that economics effectively puts limits on people's utopias or this idea of some paradise that we could potentially achieve. Um, today, I am going to focus exclusively on U.S. interventions because those are the interventions that I know the best. Uh, and frankly, the United States has a bit of a history of intervening a lot, which is something I probably don't have to tell this particular audience, right? Um, but the frameworks that I'm going to discuss more broadly are applicable outside of the United States. So you could think about them within a number of different contexts. So to begin, let's talk about the scale of US intervention. So if we look between September 11th, 2001, so the terrorist attacks on the United States, which then launched the global war on terror, the US has engaged in more than 170 notable deployments abroad of its military. Now, a natural follow-up question would be something like, well, what exactly is a notable deployment? And the answer to that question is, I don't really know. Uh, the document that I was looking at, which was an official government document, didn't quite define what it meant by notable intervention. So I'm frankly not quite sure. Suffice it to say, or we can say with confidence, that the U.S. has intervened, at least officially, quite a lot, and maybe more unofficially. Within the Latin American context, the U.S. has intervened quite a bit. So, at least the ones that we are aware of, talking about 56 different interventions by the United States into Latin America. And again, these are the ones that, that we are aware of. So this in, is part of those notable deployments. Some of these might also go back further than that 2001 date that I mentioned earlier. Another question that you might ask, so seeing this number of deployments would be something like, well, why? What's your problem, United States? Why are you here, there, and everywhere? And we could talk about this in more detail. Typically, you encounter three different arguments for why the US has intervened so much abroad. Uh, one of those arguments is that it is within the quote unquote security interest of the United States. You might be able to make this argument in some cases. Within the context of Latin America, however, this is not a particularly great argument. Uh, in fact, we know from looking at things like historical archives and interviews with former US officials that security is not the principal motive behind US interventions, particularly in Latin America. So from here, there are two typically other arguments that you would encounter. These are similar but different in terms of exactly how they are articulated, um, but they have to do with this idea of capitalist and imperialism. Uh, so one of these uh, arguments takes the form of it's within the interest of, say, U.S. businesses or uh, economic interest for the government to intervene abroad, and because of those political connections, 
you have uh, intervention. So examples of this would be something like the overthrow of President Arbenz in 1954 because of the relationship between uh, officials in United Fruit and officials in the US government. And you can find other examples of this as well. Other individuals make the argument that this uh, link between capitalism and imperialism is supposedly much broader. Uh, the argument here goes something like, imperialism is necessary for capitalism. And so if you read individuals like Marx, if you read Lenin, if you read the people who come after them, you'll see this type of argument. Now, some of my co-authors and I have worked to push back against this particular argument. We suggest that it is not a requirement of capitalism for imperialism to occur, but instead the things that people tend to blame on the economic system are more appropriately blamed on the political system. And so while we could say that politics or economics and uh, politics have been interconnected or capitalism and imperialism have been interconnected, that that's not necessary between the two different items, that imperialism isn't necessary for capitalism. Now, how you disentangle those two things, sounds like fun, uh, we're not really sure. The other thing that you might consider as a potential motive for intervention would be something like an anti-communist ideology. This is particularly relevant in the period, say, after uh, the World War II, so between, say, 1946 and 1990. This would be a particularly relevant discussion in terms of motive. So you could think about also, too, the United States is maybe having a bit of a phrase in English would be like a democracy fetish, or we have this tendency to want to spread democracy absolutely everywhere. So I have a couple quotes to illustrate that. So this is one from President Woodrow Wilson. So he would have been the president of the United States during World War I, talking about the supposed need to make the world free for democracy and the United States needing to be these like champions of democracy abroad. A bit more of a contemporary example comes from the US president, uh, former US president George W. Bush, so this is from 2005, saying that it is not only important to spread the ideas of democracy for the sake of spreading them, but it is also again with the interest, or within the interest of the United States and its own security to spread democracy. So what has the success rate looked like? for US interventions abroad? And this question can actually be a bit complicated to answer because how do we define success or failure? For instance, if you read US documents related to the global war on terror, very few, if any of them, actually define what success looks like. George W. Bush, when he declares this war on terror in 2001, states that the US, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's effectively a quote, won't stop until terrorism has been completely eliminated. That is not an achievable goal. No one would have thought that that was an achievable goal. So you would think that after that, people would come up with something more concrete, something that we could actually measure. And yet, we don't always know. People who have attempted to measure the effects of intervention, so either coming up with some kind of metric or, for success or looking at how officials, when they have defined success, have defined it, the results are frankly not good. So here up on the slides, uh, I have a quote from a paper uh, by Bruce Buena de Mesquita and George Downs from 2004 talking about the specific idea of gun barrel diplomacy. So think about like exporting democracy through the military or at gunpoint. And so looking at the period between World War II and 2004, they find that the US has intervened 35 times in the developing world, but in only one single case did a stable democracy emerge after that intervention. So one out of 35. So not a particularly impressive track record. When we look at analyses of foreign intervention, what do we tend to see? 
and what might give an economist pause about these analyses? Well, primarily, a lot of the analyses of foreign intervention, whether they are academic and especially if they are uh, done through the government, downplay or completely ignore the constraints that officials and the military face when they are intervening abroad. Uh, if you would like a little bit of evidence here, I have a couple for you. So here we have a quote from a former senator and former presidential candidate, also former first lady, Hillary Clinton, saying, Americans have always risen to the challenges we have faced. That is who we are. It is in our DNA. We do believe there are no limits to what is possible or what can be achieved. So we are taking constraints and just completely assuming them away. Other examples, again, George W. Bush. So this one's more recent from 2018. He was giving a speech. It says, the only way to peace was through partnership and engagement. If we are together, nothing is impossible. So again, this idea of assuming away constraints. So what I would like to do for you all with the hour that I have with you today is to do two things. The first thing that I would like to discuss with you is why it is that foreign interventions tend to fail. So I know the title of the talk is War, Peace, and Foreign Intervention. War is a type of foreign intervention. So through doing the analysis this way, we're not only going to encompass war, but we'll also encompass or we'll talk about other types of interventions which don't include war, but are nonetheless particularly important. If the CIA overthrows your government, for example, that's pretty important, right? You might think that that's worth studying, and it might be just as, if not more important, than if the United States invades someone's country. So I would like to talk about why it is that foreign interventions fail. I'm going to give you a few different reasons why that's the case. And then what I want to conclude with, or the second part, is I want to talk to you about what my co-author and I have referred to as the interventionist mindset. So what kind of mentality do individuals within the United States or elsewhere need to possess in order to believe and to feel confident in carrying out interventions abroad? So let me start with those reasons. I'm going to offer you six different reasons that foreign interventions may fail. The first reason for the failure of foreign intervention is that there is a disconnect between intentions and results. So proponents of foreign intervention tend to make a critical assumption that if their intentions are good, then the outcomes must necessarily be good as long as those intentions are combined with the necessary resources. So whether that's equipment or personnel, whatever it happens to be. This neglects the idea of unintended consequences. So I've had a chance to walk around UFM, and I've noticed a lot of names of a lot of people that I've read over the course of my academic career. One of the names uh, that I've seen on your timeline uh, in one of the buildings you have is the name of Frederick Bastiat. Frederick Bastiat has a very famous uh, article where he talks about this idea of the seen and the unseen, or policies or outcomes that are readily visible versus those that take a while for us to visualize or to see. One of the primary reasons that foreign interventions fail is because people neglect to think about those unseen consequences. So allow me to give you an example. So the person who's up here on this slide is a man by the name of Munmar Gaddafi. So Gaddafi was the dictator of Libya. He assumed this dictatorship, and Libya, by the way, in case uh, need a geography refresher, because I probably would, um, is northern Africa. So Gaddafi is a dictator. He assumed power well before any of you were born. In 2011, uh, a group of international states, including and largely led by the United States, decided to overthrow Munmar Gaddafi. So the quote that I have up here is from former US President Barack Obama, who talks about the rationale behind the intervention. This idea that social order had completely broken down, that the, there wasn't, it didn't really look like the option of doing nothing was longer uh, an option. 
Uh, Obama, later on in this interview, pushes off the blame, by the way, to the US's foreign partners, which is frequently a typical move. So it was like, I didn't want to, but the British were really interested in overthrowing Gaddafi. So that's why we decided to help. So what happened? Gaddafi was overthrown. Uh, he was later executed a few months after he was deposed. And there were a variety of unintended and unseen consequences as a result of this particular intervention. So within the context of Libya, the overthrow created what's called a power vacuum. In other words, it wasn't clear who was in charge. So then what did you have? You had a variety of different rebel groups and factions who started vying for control of the country. So then Obama, later on in an interview, describes, and this is a direct quote, he says, Libya is a shit show. Quite a quote for a US president to be offering. Um, he later would state that his greatest regret or greatest failure as president was failing to plan for what happened after they had overthrown Gaddafi. So they had a plan to get rid of him, but no plan for what happened after that. So nine years after the fall of Gaddafi, so this is coming from 2020, uh, researchers at the US Institute for Peace pointed out that the country was continuing to struggle in terms of finding its footing with a stable government. Well, I have a little bit more, I think, a couple of slides later, but I'll, I'll spoil it for you a little bit. In 2023, Libya is still engaged in civil war. I said, so was Gaddafi better or worse than civil war? We might be able to measure that empirically. We might have subjective or personal feelings about that but very clearly an unintended consequence. But it wasn't just Libya that presented, uh, uh, wasn't just Libya where we were observing these problems. The overthrow of Gaddafi also created an incredible amount of regional instability within North Africa. So these countries that I have up here, so you can see Libya up there, its capital is Tripoli, which is right on, uh, right on the border, right on the ocean. And the other country that's highlighted in yellow is the country of Mali. Now, why is Mali important? Mali had experienced a rebellion at one point in its history from a particular group of rebels called the Taregs. Well, the Taregs left Mali and went and sought refuge in Libya. Now, Gaddafi, who was in power at the time, sees this rebel group and figures out a way to utilize them. So Gaddafi makes the Tareg rebels his private security force. So what does he do? He offers them weapons, and he offers them training. So now you have a better trained rebel group and a better equipped rebel group. So when Gaddafi was overthrown from power, what happened? That rebel group who had been in, Mal or who had been in Libya, where do you think they went? They went back home except now they had better weapons and they had better training. So this then kicked off a civil war in Mali as a direct result of the intervention. So we see now that officials from a variety of different countries, so the neighbors of Libya, some who have Tareg groups of their own who may also cause various uh, civil unrest, have met as recently as two years ago to discuss the regional problems that have resulted from the overthrow of the Libyan government. If you want to, again, think about this more broadly, Libya had a lot of weapons. Gaddafi is gone. It's not clear who's in charge. There are these rebel groups that are fighting. Those weapons that are in Libya are unsecured. So this presents a major problem for those of us who research things like international terrorism. Because what do you have? You have a country that's unsecure, its borders are insecure. So now you have things like Libya's op operating as a safe haven for terrorist groups who now also have weapons that they can more easily access. So let's talk about the second reason that interventions fail. It's a reliance on top-down planning. So if you look at interventions or proponents of interventions, there is this tendency to look at the plans or the ideas of quote unquote experts who supposedly possess all of the information necessary to make interventions work. 
It's assumed that the institutions necessary for things like growth and economic development can be rationalized or can be imposed from the outside in. So some foreign group can come in and this foreign group can push those institutions into places where those institutions do not exist. The reason that this is a particular problem, it has to do with something that's referred to as institutional stickiness. So what does this mean? Liberal orders, liberal meaning things like, say, private property rights, trade, and things like that, liberal orders are constrained by the absence of certain institutions. So those things that I just mentioned. Again, think things like private property rights. Without these institutions, it will be difficult, if not impossible, for us, us being, say, like the intervening group, to construct or reconstruct those institutions. If it's not, if those institutions aren't sticking, so if we try to put those institutions in place and it doesn't work, then the only option we have as the intervening party is to keep intervening over and over and over. So for example, you might see a variety of different US interventions in Guatemala. So it wasn't just 1954, but also 1963, 1982, and 1983. Alternatively, you might see that you as the intervening force have to stay someplace for a really long time. So the US invaded Afghanistan in the year 2000. They were there for over 20 years. How did it go when they left? Not great. And it went really wrong really, really fast. So this top-down planning reliance doesn't exactly seem to work. There's a framework that I uh, particularly like for discussing this idea of institutional stickiness and why it is that it's so difficult to impose institutions from the outside in. And the author of this paper, um, the first author is an economist by the name of Peter Becky, who I know is a friend to UFM. I believe he has an honorary uh, doctorate degree from here. So uh, Pete Becky, in this paper with his co-authors, they discuss this idea of what they call the metis. So you can think about metis, and if you're drawing this like on your notes, just make like a circle. And you can think about this as being like the core beliefs of a population. So the values, the customs, the social norms that are really ingrained or very central to a society. Beyond that, they talk about, well, what happens when you try to change institutions? So I know it's a little bit difficult to read up here, so I'll tell you what it says. So this next external circle is what they call introduced endogenous institutions. Now, endogenous just means like internal to or inside of. So introduced internal institutions. So this would be the idea that people within a society work to change or alter the institutions in which or the institutions of their society. So this would be like, if we want to use Guatemala as an example, this would be like the people of Guatemala attempting to change the institutions of Guatemala. That's what that would be. In the ring kind of beyond that, so again, you get further out, there's this idea of endogenously imposed exogenous institutions. And as someone who is learning a second language, I apologize when these types of terms come up because Gross. These are remarkably difficult for English speakers, much less non-native speakers. So if it's indigenously imposed, but it's exogenous. So exogenous just means from the outside. So this would be like if Guatemala, the people of Guatemala, wanted to try to adopt institutions from somewhere else. So again, the people who are doing the acting would be the people of Guatemala, but the institutions would be foreign to Guatemala. Does this make sense? All right, and then the last outer ring here is exogenously imposed exogenous institutions. So again, exogenous just meaning coming from the outside. So outside individuals attempting to push outside institutions onto a foreign country. So this would, an example, be something like the US government attempting to impose US institutions on Guatemala or someplace else. 
The point that Becky and his co-authors make in this paper is this. The farther out we get from those core components of society, those core ideas, the more difficult it is for those institutions to stick. Think about where most types of intervention are going to fall. They're going to fall in that outermost ring. And so as a result, they're going to be the most difficult to stick. Okay. Reason number three is an ignorance of social and historical context. This one drives me absolutely insane. And my guess would be is it will probably drive you all absolutely insane too. What I have up here on the slide is a quote from General Stanley McChrystal. This name might not uh, mean anything to you because you're not from the US, but you're also young. So you wouldn't know it even if you were. If I asked my students back at the University of Tampa, they wouldn't know probably who this was either. Stanley McChrystal was the uh, top military official at one point responsible for the US war in Afghanistan. And this quote, he says, we didn't know enough and we still don't know enough, most of us, me included, keep in mind, he's the top US official related to the war in Afghanistan. We had a very superficial understanding of the situation and history of Afghanistan. We had a frighteningly simplistic view of recent history for the last 50 years. Exactly how frightening, you might ask. Uh, the, U, the topographical maps or the maps that the US government was using in Afghanistan were updated versions of maps that were created in the 1850s. That's horrifying. So the knowledge that they had was remarkably outdated. Let me offer you another example. During World War II, Germany had a foothold in Latin America, particularly within Brazil and also within Argentina. The US government recognizes this, and so as a result, starts implementing a variety of different kind of clandestine or secret activities within Latin America, including sending spies to a variety of different countries. In one of these particular instances, the spy steps off the plane in Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil, and he's feeling very confident because he's had a lot of Spanish lessons. Imagine his shock when he finds out, wait, they don't speak Spanish in Brazil. They speak Portuguese. The US government agency who had trained him had not bothered to check or to have basic knowledge of the places in which they were going to make sure that the people they were sending had competency in the correct language. Also, again, related to Afghanistan, I was actually wrong. It wasn't 1850s, it was 1815. They talk about this approach later on, not only the simplicity in terms of understanding uh, the map or what they were looking at, so what tribes were located where, but also a complete misunderstanding of uh, the culture of Afghanistan. Reason four. So the fourth reason that interventions tend to fail is this emphasis on the collective versus the individual. There are these ideas of collective goals, and you'll see a lot of discussions related to things like the national interest or global or societal welfare. The unit of analysis or where we focus our research oftentimes is at the level of the nation state or the level of the country. So you'll hear things or you'll read things like the United States government invaded Afghanistan or the government of Guatemala implemented this policy. This, if, and it might seem, a, it may seem strange to think about it this way, but what this effectively does is it places the action on this larger whole unit. But the reality of the situation is that there is no uh, entity or no individual called the United States. There is no acting individual called Guatemala. It's individuals within 
those societies who are doing the acting. If we fail to appreciate where the action is actually occurring, then we get radically different results in terms of policies, but also in terms of what we perceive as being possible outcomes. So this in particular, it's what's called the difference between methodological individualism, or again, using the individual as our unit of analysis, compared to what's called methodological holism, or again, thinking about an entire unit as our unit of analysis. So again, things like the United States or Guatemala. The problem, or if you look at this literature, if you look at international relations, almost all of that literature takes this collective or this holistic approach. So the dominant frameworks that we have for thinking about things like war or peace or any type of intervention are fundamentally, at least potentially, and I would argue, are fundamentally flawed with the approach, the methodological approach that they take to the study of these activities. If your approach is wrong, then it's very likely that what you're going to suggest as a result of those approaches is going to fail. Some examples of this that you might see um, would be in the language that's often used to discuss interventions. So I have just a couple of examples here. So this is Ambassador Lewis Luck from 2010. So uh, Haiti had a major earthquake in either 2008 or 2009, um, which struck particularly hard the Haitian capital of Port-au-Prince. And so in this quote, Luck says, it's ironic, but after the immense suffering, we do have an opportunity Haiti is now so profoundly broken that there is really a chance to put it, whatever it is, uh, back together in a way that all of the well-intentioned developmental programs of the past would not have done. So again, this idea of we and it and them, failing to appreciate the appropriate level of analysis. You see a lot of this in a similar uh, way today when talking about the current war in Ukraine. So again, if you're ever listening to officials who are talking or you're reading statements, look at the language that they're using. They're not saying US officials or Guatemalan officials putting the acting where it appropriately belongs, but instead are using said things like we, it, them, us. We's don't act. It's don't act. People do. All right, five. We're in the home stretch of the reasons that foreign interventions fail. So the fifth reason that foreign interventions fail is because there is this reliance of, or on the use of politics over markets. So I mentioned before that interventions tend to rely uh, almost exclusively on the opinions and plans of experts. But governments don't operate the same way that markets do. So if you all go up to like the cat, one of the cafes here on campus and you order a cup of coffee, that's a private transaction. Buyers and sellers, they respond to signals which are generated by the price mechanism. So let me give you an example. So let's say you walk up to one of the cafes tomorrow and you notice that the price of, cup of, of a cup of coffee is four times as high as it was today. That's going to send you, as a potential buyer, a signal. It's going to tell you, this cup of coffee is more valuable than it was yesterday. So then what are you going to do as a result? You face an incentive to conserve or to reduce your consumption. So maybe if you're somebody like me who drinks a lot of coffee on a daily basis, so I might drink about like three or four cups of coffee a day. I really like coffee. But if I'm having to pay four times the price of coffee, I'm not gonna drink as much coffee. I'll figure out a way to get by on just one single cup of coffee, right? So the price goes up, you as a buyer respond to that signal by reducing your consumption. At the same time, if producers see that the price of coffee is now much, much higher, they look at that and they say, oh, I can earn a greater profit, I can make more money if I produce more coffee. So what do they have an incentive to do? they're gonna to wanna to produce more coffee. The same type of dynamic also works in reverse when prices fall. Does this make sense so far? 
This is different, though, than how governments work. Governments operate within bureaucracies. Government bureaucracies don't respond to price signals like coffee shops do. Consumers of defense products don't respond to price signals like consumers of coffee or other types of private goods do. Instead of competing for customers, government bureaus are instead competing for government budgets. Whereas private businesses, they determine their success or failure by profit or loss. If they're earning a profit, what does that tell them? You're doing a good job. You're providing something of value for society. On the other hand, if you're operating at a loss, what does that tell you? You're not providing something of value to society, and you should change. If you don't, you'll continue to lose money and eventually go out of business. Bureaus, however, they don't face that same incentive. So let me ask you this question. Let's say that you are a member of a government bureau. And you'll have to forgive me. I'm ignorant of the different branches or parts of the Guatemalan government. But let's say that you're like a small agency in the government of Guatemala. And you go to the federal Guatemalan government and you say, you know what? I've come up with this great idea. I can do or I figured out a way that our agency can do its job, but we can spend 10% less than what we're spending now. What do you think will happen to your budget next year? Is it going to be the same? No. The government of Guatemala is going to say, great, we'll cut your budget by 10% next year. You as the agency are not going to like that. So what are you going to do? You're not going to have any kind of an incentive to conserve or cut cost. If anything, you're going to have an incentive to spend your entire budget and maybe go over budget because you want to be able to go back and ask the federal government for more money next year. We also see things within this context like rent-seeking or political competition, people looking to get political favors put in place where you don't see those types of things within a market setting. Here's an example from the United States. This one, I think, is a really pointed example of this dynamic. So I don't know if you all recognize this or not. Um, one of my research areas is on military technology. This here is what's called a RQ-4 Predator drone. Drone or otherwise an unmanned aerial vehicle. So this was one of the primary drones used in the War on Terror. Now, in 2012, former President Obama went to the US military and said, you all are overspending. We need you to cut your budgets. So the Air Force goes through, and it looks through its programs, and it goes back to the president, and it says, this drone right here, we don't want anymore. It's operationally ineffective. In fact, we like this old plane that we flew in the Cold War better than this thing. It's also really, really expensive. It was supposed to cost 20 million US dollars to build each of them. It instead has cost 220 million US dollars to build each of them. So if we stop flying them and we don't buy the two that we are scheduled to buy, we can save several million dollars over the next few years. So what happens? Northrop Grumman, who's the manufacturer of this particular piece of military equipment, they started to push elected officials to implement policies to prevent this from happening. They even went so far as to create a website called Save the Global Hawk. Like, it sounds like an environmental website. They create this website to try to get individual citizens to email their elected officials to stop this from happening. So what occurs is this. The piece of legislation that sets the US military budget every year for the following year contained the following law the Air Force was forbidden from grounding the fleet. And it required them to purchase the units that they said they didn't want. Right? Difference between politi politics and markets. The last reason that mar interventions tend to fail is this rejection of complex phenomenon. This idea that foreign intervention is occurring in a simplistic system. 
If you read the literature, it's what's called a closed linear system, which basically means that the people who are intervening can understand all of the necessary parts of the system. So we know the system well enough that we know this action will cause this particular consequence. So here's an example. This is an example of US planning in terms of how you get a country to go from a place you don't want it to a place you do want it. So what do you do if you want a stable democracy? You just simply follow the five steps that are up here at the top. So promote civic participation, promote a free media, build a legitimate executive institution, develop systems of representation, and promote a civil society. Easy, it's like following a recipe. If you want to have a stable economy, it's the same type of thing. Again, five easy steps. Now sometimes, officials look at that and they go, you know, maybe this is a little bit too simplistic. And so in that case, you might find something like this. This is an actual graphic created and circulated by the US Department of Defense that they were remarkably proud of because they said, look at how complicated but colorful it is. See how we have all of these arrows going in these different directions? It looks insane, right? But even this is necessarily simplistic in terms of trying to impose external institutions or external plans on another country. And remember, these are the same people who are saying they don't face any constraints and who don't understand that in Brazil they speak Portuguese and not Spanish. So from here, I want to move on to talk a bit about the interventionist mindset. So this is something that uh, one of my dear friends and co-authors and I, Chris Coyne, have worked on extensively. And we've developed this, or we, we've come up with a framework for what we say is this interventionist mindset. And why is this potentially important? In order for individuals to carry out or think they can carry out a particular type of intervention, they have to either possess or acquire, or they have to get a particular mentality. If they don't, then they're not going to feel confident and comfortable within the position of trying to impose these changes on individuals abroad. So I'll talk about these very, very briefly, and, and then I'll conclude. So advocates of foreign intervention tend to be extremely confident in their ability to solve complex problems in other societies. We know what's better. We see this problem. We, again, I'm speaking as somebody from the United States, talking about the United States. Your country has this problem. We know better. We can fix it. That's the mentality. Also, as the phrase I just said might indicate, advocates of foreign intervention also tend to possess this sense of superiority, both in terms of knowledge as well as in terms of being righteous or feeling like that they are correct. So here's an example. So this is from uh, the ex-Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, responding to the uh, decision by the people of Chile in 1973 to elect Salvador Allende. So he says, I don't see why we need to stand by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibilities of its own people. The issues are much too important for the Chilean voters to be left to decide for themselves. I. Henry Kissinger, know better than the people of Chile what the people of Chile want. And so what does he do? He plays an important part in overthrowing the government of Chile and installing Augusto Pinochet. Advocates of foreign intervention also tend to feel very comfortable, confident, and justified in imposing their preferences on other people, including by the use of force where necessary. Accept it or accept it at gunpoint. Those are your two options. They are also extremely confident in that massive bureaucratic structure that I talked about a few moments ago. They are confident in this entanglement between government and private interest to implement these policies and solve these problems. It's what's referred to in the literature uh, as the military-industrial complex, or sometimes the military-industrial-congressional complex. In other words, the entanglement of all of these different interest groups. Other things too, advocates of foreign intervention tend to be remarkably unsympathetic toward foreigners. 
Now, this one might strike you as a bit strange because you think, well, wait a minute. If they're intervening abroad, then they must think that they, they want to help people, right? That's often not the case. And in fact, if you see or if you read the quotes from US officials when intervention has been rejected by foreign countries or the intervention has failed, and remember, one out of 35 was successful since 2001. So when interventions fail, it's not a problem with us. It's not a problem with the interveners. It's a problem with the people who are being intervened upon. So here are a couple different examples. And this goes way, way back in history. So here I have a quote from Stokely Morgan. He's the assistant chief of the Division of Latin American Affairs. This is from 1926, and I know this is kind of small. So he says this, if the United States has received but little gratitude, this is only to be expected in a world where gratitude is rarely accorded to the teacher, the doctor, or the policeman. And we have been all three. He's talking about US intervention into Latin America, by the way, as you might have guessed based on his title. He says, but as these young nations grow and develop a greater capacity for self-government and finally take their places upon an equal footing with the mature, older nations of the world, it may be that in time they will come to see the United States with different eyes and have for her something of the respect and affection with which a man regards the instructor of his youth and a child looks up to the parent who has molded his character. It's not an us problem. It's an everybody else problem. It's your fault. You just being, again, whoever's being intervened upon. Your fault, not the US's fault. Again, if you want something a bit more contemporary, because 1926 was quite a long time ago, let me give you this one from President Biden. When the US withdrew from Afghanistan and the government of Afghanistan collapsed pretty much immediately, uh, President Biden says this. We trained and equipped an Afghan military force, some 300,000 strong, incredibly well equipped, a force larger in size than the militaries of many of our NATO allies. We gave them every tool they could need. We paid their salaries, provided for the maintenance of their air force, something the Taliban doesn't have. We gave them every chance to determine their own future. What we could not provide was the will to fight for that future. Again, it's not our problem, it's everyone else's problem. Uh, and finally, just to wrap up here and then I'll conclude, proponents of foreign intervention tend to grossly underestimate the cost of intervention. This is mo both monetarily speaking, but also tend to exclude the cost that are imposed on the individuals who are receiving that intervention. Because guess what? People who are being intervened upon can't vote in US elections. We don't have to pay attention to those costs. Is somebody an enemy combatant or not? Well, if we define an enemy combatant as any military-aged male in a strike zone, then the number of civilian casualties drops way down. Uh, military-aged male, by the way, is between the ages of about 15 and 65, in case you were curious. Advocates of foreign intervention also tend to embrace an unwavering sense of nationalism. Being a proponent or going along with the intervention suggests that you are patriotic. So in my context, going along with US policy means that you are a good American. You are patriotic, you love your country. And if you question those policies, you are un-American and unpatriotic. How dare you speak against the US military in any capacity. So why is this important? As I mentioned before, this mindset tends to downplay those constraints. It neglects the realities in which we live. It ignores issues related to the knowledge that we can possess, as well as the uh, incentives that interveners face. There is a profound irony with the idea of imposing or implementing democratic change at the point of a gun. So just very briefly, how should we move forward? So if we want to start to really understand or think about intervention and move away from those other types of analyses, what should we do? We should ground our analysis in political economy. Understand incentives, look at knowledge, understand this seen and unseen. 
and understand, importantly, the gaps between the know what and the know how. We know the types of institutions that tend to lead to economic prosperity. Adam Smith talked about them. He's someone else who I've seen around on your campus on the walls. So peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. We know those institutions are good, but how do we get them in places where they are not? That's a question that we don't know the answer to. With that, muchas gracias.